More people every day are ditching animal products, embracing plant-based foods, and speaking up for what matters. With my experience as an international instructor for vegan nutrition and an award-winning author, I interview experts, innovators, and celebrities about the global movement towards a plant-based future. Do you want to learn how to combat the injustice in our food system affecting your health, the animals, and the planet? Well, you're in the right place. It all starts here with eating like you give a damn. Welcome to the Eating Like You Give a Damn podcast, the place to discover your passion for plant-based living one bite at a time. I'm your host, Stephanie Harder. Imagine for a moment waking to the sound of a rooster's crow and the clucking and chirping of hens and baby chicks and walking out onto your back porch to view the lush green landscape on a gorgeous day with a beautiful pond full of families of ducks and geese bathing and quacking away. And to your surprise, you see your pig dragging his blanket across the field from a nearby pen to establish his own preference for sleeping under the porch. And then he goes back to collect his toys one by one to place near his newly selected bed. And as you're scratching your head to how this is even possible, when you are sure that you latched that pen yourself, you watch as a mama cow nuzzles and grooms her daughter with the same kind of love that you experience with other people in your life. Your farm dogs are watching over the goats who are headbutting each other playfully. And then you notice one of the goats is standing on his hind legs on top of a roof of a chicken enclosure, reaching for the limbs above. And you think, huh, how clever is he? These are just some of the amusing behaviors Kelly McCormick and Glenn Maresca wake up to every day at Florida Rescue Farm. In this episode, you'll hear how Glenn and Kelly originally started a homestead in rural Florida to remove themselves from the modern food system. They planned to raise their animals for their own milk, eggs, and meat, and then developed empathy for the animals that they raised for food and converted to an animal rescue farm and sanctuary. You'll hear them reference some of these animals by name, such as Mooby and Maybe and Norman, and you'll hear them talk about how the animals develop friendships and protect one another. We also talk about the economics of meat, dairy, and eggs, and how living as vegans helps them to save animals and the planet despite what the government is doing. And if you've ever wondered what it's like to start and run a farm animal sanctuary and how to budget for it, we totally cover that too. Now, my husband Dave and I first visited Florida Rescue Farm a few years ago, back when Kelly and Glenn were just starting down the path to living a vegan lifestyle. And after seeing the passion that they have for these animals as they told the tales of each of these animals, you know, their stories and they would talk about their unique characteristics and behaviors. I decided to help contribute to their mission by donating a portion of the proceeds from my book sales for the Skinny on Eating Like You Give a Damn to help provide for these animals. So if you're looking for a guide and a resource to help you along your path to eating more plant-based, visit eatinglikeyougiveadam.com forward slash book to order your copy of the Skinny on Eating Like You Give a Damn today. Now, on with the show with Florida Rescue Farm. I am super, super excited. I can't even contain my excitement right now to introduce the Florida Rescue Farm, Glenn and Kelly. What is up? <laughs> <laughs> I am just thrilled to be able to have you guys on because um, we have a unique relationship that I had to actually go through my Google photos and remember, like, how long ago exactly was it that we met when my husband Dave and I first found your farm and went to visit you? That was three years ago. It was June of 2016. Yeah, Yeah. well, you were vitally important to our... Becoming vegan. Becoming vegan. Yeah. So it was... um, That's how we know. You were the first vegan on the farm. You were. We were scared of vegans. (laughs) Yeah, we were were scared. I don't know. (laughs) You know, we didn't know what a vegan was. I was like... um, Something that I have to say to you... um, Part of, of what made us become vegan was your compassion. And Aww. it's so important for people to, to 
you know, it's okay. Some people are vegetarian, some people are eating meat, but if you embrace them with compassion instead of attacking them, it's really going to change people. And it changes. You're that. asking questions instead of telling people what's going, you know, it, it's a big difference to make somebody else realize the next step. And, and um, you helped us do that. And then not only you, there was a few other people yeah. that came after you that, that really um, solidified it. And if they sure. would have came at us in any way that was not, as say, compassionate. As compassionate, yeah. you know, and, and they listened to us, and we had questions, you know what I mean? Because at that yeah. time, we were still, we were doing our own dairy. We were still eating the eggs from the rescued chickens. So we didn't consider ourselves vegan, and we didn't go full vegan until we realized that veganism is a movement, which you had a great um, thing getting us going to that oh, point. Oh, well, that's really, really and, great to hear. Well, it yeah. is. Well, it actually was, and that it is a, a compassionate And movement. what's cool about that, you have to realize that people, um, you know, when you talk to someone who's not vegan and you do try to help them out and show them the way, you could be changing somebody's life. Yeah. And, like, right. how amazing is that, you know, that you can have a conversation with someone that sparks an interest that leads them to a so life that, that, that doesn't kill animals. I mean, that's Absolutely. amazing. Yeah. And, and and how much does that benefit the animals? Yeah, mm-hmm. right. So eventually. <laughs> oh, yeah. The benefits yeah. are just like, you know, I mean, it's, it's more than just animals, you know, now. Now we understand no, more about the environment. Health. Exactly. Yeah. So Any there's just aspect of it. so many different facets to just mm-hmm. opening up the floor to have the conversation. And you guys, when I met you, you were like totally open to it. So even if you didn't quite know what a vegan was and you were a little scared <laughs> yeah, yeah. of the idea of it, well, you we guys were super open to the conversation. And that yeah. is exactly because what gets well, we me up come at every it. morning. <laughs> yes, because yeah. we had come at it from a different angle. We were, we realized that the commercial food industry was, was horrible, that it was not um, giving you nutrition. It was just basically giving you calories. And right. we wanted to produce all our own stuff and, and all our own food, our vegetables, and that included raising meat also. So we were going to do it all, and we were going to do it ourselves. And like Kelly said, we were going to eliminate the grocery store um, and, 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 and do it all ourselves. And through that process, we learned that, you know, but by raising the animal, we knew we we're never going to kill each other. You know? Right, so, right. So th- I think this you know? is a really, really great place to kind of kick off because, I, you know, I'm really curious. This is one thing we didn't get too deep into any time that we've talked. You know, what was your life like before? Like, what was it like before you had the idea that you wanted to get out of the commercial food system and that you wanted to start your own homestead and living off of the land? What sparked that interest? I actually- I actually worked in a restaurant um, um, as a cook, as a saute cook. And um, Kelly was, what were you doing there? I, I was doing, I, I did like computer work, yeah. like websites and stuff. But I also volunteered at a lot of wildlife rescues. Mm-hmm. And I look back on it, and it's funny that you would go there all day and take care of wild animals and like, you know, take care of baby possums and feed the owls and do all the stuff. But then you'd go home at night and eat chicken. Yeah, and, and, and I honestly did not see. I did not realize that that was. But you wrong. were first to realize. Cause you were like, we need to eat less meat. We yeah. need to start doing stuff like you were the yeah. one that started pushing me towards it. Because being as as a cook and growing up as, as, in New York, where I was raised, um, you had meat with every meal. I mean, um, it, was, it was three times a day. Well, it was um, quite a transition for me. Um, and at one point in my life, I was like, I, I will never stop eating meat, you know. And um, But she likes him. Well, isn't that weird. what most people say, too? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and throughout my life, I, like, I would, I'd be vegetarian for a while, and then I wouldn't. I kind of drifted back and forth because I, I think I understood it somewhat, but I never really thought about it. And, that's and where did you originally, here. and where did you grow up, Kelly? Um, I was born in Fort Lauderdale, but I was raised in Colorado, and they ah. came back to Florida when I was, like, 15. Okay. Um, but I never I, – I would go vegetarian because, eh, I didn't want to eat meat, but I didn't think about, like, why am I not eating meat? It was just a thing. Mm-hmm. There's something – when you finally realize what's happening – you just can't go back to that. No, you can't. You know, you sure. want, once you know. And if you ever work with these animals, and like I, I, I can't take for them for 20, 24 hours a day, um, you, you will never eat them. Well, sure. I remember at the end um, when we were, we were down, we were, eating, we were still eating store-bought chicken. And um, 
and and we were like, you know, chickens are like they're they're like raptors. You know what I mean? They don't they don't have friends. And we had these two hens, um, Lady Day and Big Bird, and they went everywhere together. They were best friends. They did not arrive here together. They just became friends. And um, when Big Bird, she got very old and she was passing away, her friend Lady Day stayed with her the whole time. Oh, wow. She kept all the other chickens off of her and she protected her. Oh, and um, Yeah. And, and Big Bird passed away and not a day later, Lady Day passed away. And mm. it, I, it left a mark, you know, and, and now that I know what to look for, you see their friendship and you think they're just chickens, but they're not. They're sentient just like everybody. Now, do you think that was a moment that kind of just kind of rocked your world where you really started to make yeah. more of an empathetic connection to what the animals are experiencing? I mean, a lot of people don't give yeah. a lot of credit to chickens, but you exactly. saw you saw something and you felt empathy. Yes. And that's and here's the thing. We see this every day here. And I and that's why. I can't imagine doing this and you not having. They that. all have relationships just like me and you. They got friends. They got people they avoid. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's how you know it's genuine. That's how you know it's genuine. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, they, they are um, amazing. And just, well, and and even cross species. Um, yeah. We had um, a duck uh, some time ago. Was being uh, there was a big um, alligator snapping turtle had gotten into our pond, and it was trying to pull a duck underwater. Oh, wow. One of the geese swam over. Glenn was on the shore. He couldn't get to the duck. So the goose swam over. It actually pushed the duck to shore where Glenn could rescue it, get the turtle off of it, and take care of the duck. It knew. And, it, you know, they're totally different species, and yet it wanted to help its fellow animal. So it's things wow. like that. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, it's the interspecies. You know the movie story. I mean, that was that was a big thing that changed my life um, was, was movie. Um, we have four cows. And I was out front picking up fertilizer, and um, the cows, when they when they want to protect their calves from the ranchers, when the ranchers come to take the calves away from them in the beef industry, they will um, circle. They'll make a circle around their calves to protect right. them, and then the ranchers have to break through to um, to get through them. And um, so I was out there, and the cows started getting close to me, and movie started pushing me, and I was like, they, they had they started looking. The cows started looking towards the orchard, and I looked towards the orchard, and there were two coyotes going through the orchard, and um, that's Gypsy. She's our number one guardian dog. Hi, Gypsy. <laughs> Welcome to the <laughs> show, <laughs> Gypsy. <laughs> um, so they looked over to the orchard and saw the coyote, and then I did not see the coyotes, and when I looked over, I was like, oh, wow. this is." Um, they actually circled me to protect me from something that I did not see, so... That was my favorite story that you told me the first time that I visited your farm when you told me that. I was just, I just wanted to run well, over and hug means, a movie and hug all the cows. I was like, you guys are amazing. <laughs> um, that day really changed everything for me um, as, as far as I wanted to, to um, increase our activity, even at the sanctuary to help um, people that take more private tours, to help people understand how um, cool these animals are and what a real raw deal they're getting. As far as why you decided to homestead, um, you know, I know that you were looking for that way out of the commercial food system uh, for various reasons, right? And there are a lot of people that I know that I interact with that are sort of on that journey and they don't, you know, they, they have the idea about yeah. maybe starting their own homestead and living off of the land, just like you guys, you know, how you got started. How did you mm -hmm. decide that you were the right people with the right knowledge and the right tools to actually do that? We did not have the right tools or the right knowledge. <laughs> We had somewhere, a though, right? lot of willpower. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, we, and we did, we just knew that we had to, and, and we learn, oh my gosh, we, we're still learning, you know, you sure. always learn. And, um, and, and it's important to know about homesteading that anyone can do this. And I think one of the, um, one of the misnomers about homesteading is you have to kill animals. And if I had known this from the beginning that you didn't have to kill animals, it would have made it so much easier. You know, oh, yeah. people think you move out to the country, you know, you kill your own meat, you grow your own vegetables. So you can just grow your own vegetables, and those animals you're going to use for meat can create fertilizer. Um, and, pesticide. And, and pesticide control. I mean, they, they do so many things 
there's no reason not to have them on your homestead, and there's so many reasons um, they can help you without becoming a commodity. Um, mm-hmm. But as we moved out here, we learned, you know, we, we planted gardens. We listened to our neighbors who've lived in this area for like a million years, and um, we learned how to do it. And the only thing that was horrible and that we dreaded was killing the animals. And so once you cut that out, it's fantastic. Now we're using permaculture to do gardens that are more self-sufficient and you don't have to work as much on them. Um, We have a non-human zone that collects most of the wild animals that come our way so they don't bother the other animals, the domestics. Mm -hmm. And if you work with nature, that's what's so important. Work with nature. Yes. You know, you will have a time when there's like, a lot of rats and bunnies, and you're worried. But if you sure. let nature happen, in, in a few weeks, you have more snakes and you have more raptors, and it will balance out. People are just impatient. Yeah. So just so people have an idea of, you know, your, um, your land and how many animals you have, like describe exactly what your, what your homestead is like. <laughs> well, we're a small sanctuary. We have about five and a half acres of land. Um, we probably have over a hundred residents now on on the, um, most of them chickens and ducks and geese. <laughs> um, we have um, cows. We have goats. We have sheep. sheep we pigs. have rabbits. We have pigs. Um, and what we have is a, is a really great adoption program. So one of the most important things we did since we got started, I've always maintained a database of people. And because a lot of people contact us and they want to adopt farm animals. And so we do give, put them through a vetting process where we look at, you know, where are you keeping the animals? Obviously, are you using them for food or exploitation? Um, we get their vet's name, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And then I keep them on a list. So when we get an animal, because since we're only five acres, we can't take in a, an unlimited amount of animals. Um, we will, I'll email them and we'll try to adopt the animal out to those approved homes. And this year alone, we have rehomed, um, 30 cows. Yeah. Well, and that is incredible. Here. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's really, over 50 goats. yeah, we, we've wow. done, we've rehomed a ton of animals doing that. And, and this is the thing. People are great. You know, you, you run into a lot of instances where, where you get animals that have been abused or abandoned and, and it makes you lose a little hope. But the people that visit here and the people that take in these animals and give them a good home, it restores your faith. Well, this is a part of the community and the vegan community because most of these people are vegan that are taking the animals and they're opening up their homes and their land to these animals um, at their own expense. Mm -hmm. And actually, some of them are creating sanctuaries now out of that. So, um, And there are a lot of sanctuaries opening up in Florida now, which is fantastic. The more sanctuaries, the better. We welcome that. Um, we try to um, get in touch with everyone that we hear of so they, um, to talk to them and, and maybe perhaps help or maybe learn something from them, you know. So um, the, the sanctuary community is also growing in, in Florida. And um, it's, it's, you know, I never in my life, I've always waited for something to come along that, that would have my ideals. And I was always like, you know, there's got to be something that, that envelopes my ethics and my ideals of compassion, nonviolence, um, animal welfare, and all these things. And um, if, if any of those things really hit you somewhere, then, then going vegan or plant-based, if whatever. I like to say vegan because vegan is more what it is, you know. Mm-hmm. Plant-based is kind of like plant, plant-based, plant you know. But um, it, it is something you might – really want to get into because um, it does embrace all the things that that are um, good about humanity and, and through that will benefit the animals. Well, what's sure. funny too about going vegan, um, you think it's, you know, when you are eating meat or even if you're vegetarian, you're like, oh man, you know, I can't do that. But once you do it, it's so easy. (laughs) Exactly. It really is. I think, I think there's something to be said about just making that decision. So for for anybody that's on the fence about it, you know, they, they hear about it. Maybe they feel a calling towards that, you know, that that stage of their Mm -hmm. life or that journey. It's just what it really gets down to is just making this decision to do it. And then all of a sudden, you know, all of that anxiety just kind of like washes away because everybody yeah, has different challenges, right? 
to yeah. overcome with their diet and their lifestyle and just, you know, in, in social situations. Everyone has different challenges, but just making the decision to move in that direction. Oh, yeah. man. Here I wanted to touch on, too, is that Kelly, um, what she's doing now, she, she's become a great chef, a vegan chef, but by no doubt. But, I believe um, it. I've seen her pictures. Amazing. Well, we, <laughs> yeah, I'm doing all right. Um, so, but um, what we're doing is taking their home setting, um, the, the um, make all the, your own stuff. making all your own stuff yeah. from scratch and growing it from scratch and applying it to vegan. And so we're making. Um, well, you know, when we first went vegan, I was buying like, you know, Gardein and Beyond and like all sure. the, you know, frozen sure. vegan food. And mm-hmm. they were cool, you know, but what, the reason we went to homesteading, I, went, I didn't want processed food. So then <laughs> I started kind of, you know, digging in and learning how to cook. And um, it is so awesome. Well, I, now I, we make all our own. Well, yeah, well, before, well, before when, we, when we used to do dairy, I would make our own butter and yogurt and cheese and yada, yada. And now I'm vegan, and I still make our own butter and yogurt That's what I'm saying. and cheese. You do that, and it's less expensive. Mm-hmm. It's less expensive, and it's, I I just started making a soy yogurt. That's oh, man. crazy. Yeah. yeah. It is. It, it is like it, it, it is. It is no. I would even say it was somewhat better than the yogurt I used to make with cow's milk. It is awesome. Wow, um, you're it, making me seriously yeah. hungry. <laughs> <laughs> All the foods we used to create homesteading that you know that we used to milk the yeah. cow and and you get we are now making with vegan products. They're out there. You just look for them, um, and you. You can make everything from scratch. We make our own roast beef from scratch. Yeah. I mean, well, and as as a cook, um, this has opened up so much stuff to me. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. You know, before, when you cook with meat, you're like meat, starch, vegetables. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it's boring. This, I, you have all kinds of flavors and options, and and spices then, I never even heard. Yeah, spices and different foods I never encountered until I went vegan, and that's that's one of the coolest things. Yeah, I think so too. And, you know, for, for some people that maybe aren't so savvy in the kitchen, there might be just a little bit of a learning curve, but you know, uh, I know me There's growing so up as a home cook, it was really easy transition. Um, it once I just started looking up recipes, it's, exactly. it looking up recipes. occasionally you're going to have to buy some like weird ingredient. Cool. Buy it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it like, but yeah, buy the weird ingredients, cook, yeah. keep them on your shelf because other things are going to need them. And once you have a big backlog, um, it's, it's really cool. Yeah, yeah, cool. And you said something about, you know, like milking the cows, right? So I, I know that um, some people still seem to think, and of course I, I know better, but sometimes I still hear people talking about, but doesn't the cow have to be milked? I mean, won't she explode if she's not milked? No, no, a cow, no. No, a cow doesn't have to be milked. <laughs> Um, here's, here's, here's how it works. You have to have the cow inseminated, and that's what we did because we didn't know we were still homesteading. Um, so I got maybe I bought her off a farmer. She was going to auction, so she was heading probably to be dog food. So well, I bought her because um, she was a Jersey, and at that time my mindset was a Jersey has a high butter fat content, and um, it's good milk, and it's what we want. Mm-hmm. So I bought her. We had her inseminated. We had the calf. But after you have the calf, now part of the dairy industry we didn't like was that they take the calves away from the, the moms at such, you know, a day or two, and they're gone, and, and that's a horrible, horrible thing. So we were going to keep it together, and we did, but the calf actually nursed for like a year and a half. So um, She got too she tall. She got too tall. But <laughs> what I would do, I would take the extra milk from the, you know, when they were done, I would take a little extra milk, and, and then when she was done nursing, I took about – a, mil- a cow will give as much milk as you take from it to produce. Mm. So what we were doing, we were trying to do so-called humane dairy at that time. So um, we would take, I would take a gallon to a little over a gallon of milk a day, and I would milk her once a day. So it wasn't as intrusive as um, you do in a, in a um, commercial situation where they take three to five gallons like two, three times a day, which is, I, I can't even imagine. But even the little bit of milk I was taking had a health impact on the cow itself. She was skinnier. And, I mean, we fed her 
all kinds of stuff while we were milking her, extra vegetables. We gave her extra protein so she would get, you know, reduced milk because that's what you're well, supposed to do. But imagine you're losing a gallon of calcium basically a day. I mean, that takes a toll on it. It, takes, it does take a toll on even doing it the way we were doing yeah, it. Yeah, sure. But um, that's how it works. And we, uh, you go in in the morning, and this is a great <laughs> – this is how you milk a cow. She won't let her milk down. Unless she wants to, um, unless she's hooked to a machine, I mean, which then is which is horrible, then it comes mm. down. But you got to go in, you got to like, it's like you got to coax her. It's like, hey, okay, come on, you're going to give me some milk today or what? So I used to sing to her, you know. And, um, <laughs> oh, that's, that's interesting. I, I, no, 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 it's funny. It's, 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 it gets worse. Um, so I'm like, you know, that's what I read. That's thing to her. So I'm singing like Beatles. I think Beatles are good, right? That's, that'll get it going. <laughs> yeah. Nothing. You know, I was like, I did some soul music, even though I can't sing it. I was like some Otis Redden, maybe, you know. <laughs> but um, my, my brother had sent me a Queen tape, um, a Queen CD that he had made for me. And I was listening to Queen, so I, I tried We Are the Champions. Nice. He started giving milk out like it was crazy. <laughs> so I, every morning I would have to sing um, – we are the champions to the cow to get milk for six months, but um. I would wander out <laughs> on the back porch and you hear Glenn in the cow shed. We are the champ. He's like singing the song. It was hysterical. It was so, and, and God bless her. But then, that cow was like she is so kind and it yeah. yells us no ill will. And Aww. finally one day that went on for about six months after, and then one day I went out there and we Kelly had been talking. We were like. We need to back. Um, we need to go vegan. We need to back our people in our yeah. community, and um, so uh, we were we were heading that way anyway. And I went out there, and she looked at me, and I looked at her, and I was like, "We're not going to do this anymore, are we?" And, and, um, because, and that's what we did, and I went. I gave it up. Well, and because we were taking such a limited amount of milk, um, stopping milking wasn't that hard for her. No, it's you know, not. You just it was, stop. Yeah, we just stopped. And, you, of course, you keep an eye on them to make sure they don't get mastitis or there's no problem. But she, um, she did fine. But, no, I, they don't have to be milked. They don't mm-hmm. have to be milked. And, and to this day, I mean, her daughter is, what, three, four years old yeah. now? Um, and she still cleans her daughter's ears, and she still snuggles. They up have a bond. Her. They've never been mm-hmm. separated. They bonded immediately when the calf was born, um, maybe made a noise that she's never made before after a sound. It was like to welcome the calf. It was. It was, it was a year here. It was you know. like, I'm right wow. here, I'm your mother. Yeah, and, um, they have incredible. bonded ever since. So, and these are the things you see that, that you know, it's easy to be vegan once you, when, you, when I'm right here in front of it. You know what I mean? Um, right. Because you can see the bond between the mother and the daughter and how, how it's instant and how through the years it has never changed. Well, so. and that also leads into the importance of um, farm sanctuaries and visiting farm sanctuaries. Yeah. Some, mm-hmm. I, I can imagine going vegan and not seeing the animals. It would be, it, it's a little more disconnected. And I think that by touring farm sanctuaries and getting in touch with them or volunteering at them, you see the animals you're saving. You see, you, you realize why you're doing this. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's such a huge piece of the puzzle because, you know, in today's society, the majority of us don't get the opportunity to meet a cow or to, you know, get to witness them living in their environment and, and doing what they naturally that. do no, and chickens and pigs and, and, yeah. and yeah. everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where we come in. I mean, everyone's doing their part. I mean, it's, it's a small part and there's people out on the front lines doing their part and um, the direct action everywhere, everywhere and anonymous to the voices. These out there activists out there going into slaughterhouses and, and stopping mm-hmm. the lines and stuff like that and the cubes of truth and so on. It's all, um, I believe all of it works together to create what we're trying to establish and what we're trying to get our end goal. Yeah, absolutely. Working in cohesion and, and, and coming in from different angles, I think, you know. Um, yes, it yeah. does. And it's yeah. different. You know, our approach is less in your face. You know, it's right. more, it's, it's, we give private tours. So we, um, you know, we have a family or, or people and their friends come. And it's easy to open up in that environment as, as opposed to having 30 people where you're just there and you're not going to say anything because you don't want to, you know, you're not sure you're going to, you don't know, you know. So, but um, it, we connect with the people right off the bat. Plus, 
we are the, the people who run the sanctuary. So you're not getting led around by volunteers or anything like that, you know. So you, mm-hmm. you're, um, we get to establish relationships with the people that come here right away. And, and you're sharing in the story. relationship, the stories that that um, that yeah. you know from the relationships that you've built with the animals that live exactly. at your sanctuary so as that's well. How we want to be, I don't, the, the pro, that's exactly it because I don't think someone could convey yeah. how strongly we feel, you know, and and, mm-hmm. and get our message out if it wasn't us giving that message. Sure. And so, as far as the area that you live in. I know that you're out there in, in a very rural area and you're surrounded by cattle ranchers, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Right. So, so how interesting is it for you that you're a small animal sanctuary that's surrounded by cattle ranchers? So what's, what's the relationship well, like with, with your community? It, here's the thing. You know, you would think it would be extremely tense. But we are, these people are not bad people. They're our neighbors. They're our neighbors, and they're good mm-hmm. people. If, if my cow has a problem at 3 in the morning and I can't get a vet and I have no help, I can call them, and they will come over and help us. Yeah. The problem is the reason they raise meat is because people buy meat. Okay, yes. if people were not, if people weren't buying meat, they'd be raising oh. beans and peas and potatoes and all kinds of things. I have relationships with the older ranchers and and the younger ranchers. Um, it, it's a generational thing. It, it, they it, they've been doing it for generations. Um, the younger guys, um, it's a viable option for them to. If you gave them something mm-hmm. else to do, they would do it. You know, mm-hmm. um, it, I it, realize. And, what I want to say is Sorry for that. the the government right now in the dairy industry they're buying all the um, excess milk and and what do they call it? Subsidizing. they're subsidizing yeah. the dairy industry and the beef industries. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to buy meat or milk because it would be so expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, if you took that subsidizing money and put that towards a program to transfer people to over to a plant based transfer these farmers over to plant based farming. And, and organize that, it's a viable option. Um, yeah. These guys are open to that. They don't, they, you know. All they um, want, they just want to make a living. They want to make money. Yeah. Right. Okay? And, and they don't care how they're making money. Um, and and it, But here's the thing. You can't just stop what you're doing. They got families. They got mortgages. They got loans. Exactly. You know, so, so they're tied into what they're doing. And, and it, it, as, as horrible as what they're doing is – they're tied into it, you know, and, sure. um, but if you gave them and if you would have to transition them, you know? Well, and again, we, your money drives the market yes, every day, does. three times a day. Every time you eat, you're like voting for, you know, saving animals or not voting for it. And if every time you eat, you're not buying meat, eventually there's not going to be enough sales and these people are going to quit doing it. Because it's not financially well, we viable. We just saw a statistic the other day. There were 355 dairies in Florida yeah. um, as of, what was it, like five years ago? Yep. And now they're down to 75. Or Isn't 77. that incredible? The yeah. amount so that, that, of that's cool. That's oh, yeah. And, and, that is consuming that. and right now I'm buying hay from a dairy that's having trouble selling their dairy. So now they're converting over to selling hay. So, um it's people will, people will switch, yeah. you know, they're, they're going to go where the money is. Yeah. And, yes. and you do, we have to drive the economics yes. in a capitalist society that we live in. It's all about money and sure. if it's all about money. Then that's what we have to be all about where yeah. we spend our money. And, and of and course the other, yeah. The other piece of that, yeah. I think you were probably going in this direction as consumers, you know, as consumers, we have to have the alternatives available in order to make it easy to make that yes, switch. We and do. we're seeing yeah. so much of that today. Yes, and the alternatives have become available. Let's say mm-hmm. they're coming available every day. Yeah. This, is, this is growing so fast, it, it, it's, um, it's exciting to watch. I mean, Impossible Burgers and Burger King, I mean, Tyson <laughs> Foods is making – you know, really, seriously, Tyson Foods has a plant-based line. Tyson yes. Foods. You know what I mean? So, so I mean, it is, it, it is um, it, the economic part it, it has to be pushed forward 
and, and that's probably one of the most important aspects of, of the vegan movement is where you spend your money. And what's cool, being vegan is a chance to save animals and save the planet despite what your government is doing. Yeah, exactly. It's fine. Okay, the laws and, and the things that are happening might not be on our side right now, but still just being vegan gives you a stronger voice. It allows you to, stop, it allows you to help with climate change. It allows you to save animals' lives irregardless of what our, our – elected officials do. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And this is such a strong, you know, message for going vegan, which is absolutely incredible. And what would you say to, um, you know, in a compassionate way to those people who can't really wrap their heads around it quite yet? I would say. I'm the nicer one, so I'll go first. Um, <laughs> You know what it is? It's a slippery slope. Okay, start with, like, meatless Mondays. Okay, fine. And you know what you realize? When you start eating less meat in your, say, your evening dinner, you realize it doesn't have to be dependent on meat. You realize that, like, every food doesn't have to have meat, starch, vegetable. You you start to open your mind to more creative cooking alternatives. Mm -hmm. And then... You, you, start know, to feel better. you start to feel better. You know, you have more energy, you feel better, you're more active and you, and you feel less guilty and you're like, this is great. And so then you switch to maybe being vegetarian and the whole way down the line, um, the more you learn and the more you experience, the easier it is to make the final transition. It was a long process for us. It was, it was step by step by step by step because we were homesteading and we didn't think we were doing, you know, anything that was, out of um, out of the normal, yeah. you know. Sure. So, um, yeah. And, and we were creating, our, but I would say it is something you really want to get into. And if you want to get into it, I have a great book for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, what book is that? <laughs> That's the skinny nice on eating like a deer, right? Yes. That's what I'm saying. Get a rebel for compassion. So, yeah. <laughs> Inform yourself. The China study. Um, Dr. Campbell. Anything Dr. Campbell has written. Dr. T. Campbell and um, um, documentaries. They're out there. The ones you told us about. It, uh, uh, what the hell? Yeah. Overnight. Go to a farm meeting, sanctuary. Go to a farm yes. sanctuary. Um, and and you will you will realize that there is no difference in in any living creature. It just wants to to well, live. And also, um, people. It, 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 you don't have to be so strict on yourself, you know. Yeah. You, you, nobody is perfect. There is, there are, there is meat and animal products hidden in all kinds of crazy yes, places in our lives. Mm-hmm. That's and such so a it's great okay. point. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, mean, I have read that they use like some kind of animal fats to like grease a factory where they make um, smartphones. Mm-hmm. Well, you, I, I'm not able to defeat that. Okay, <laughs> I don't sure. love to, but I can't. So, um, but you do what you can, where you can. You where know? you can. That's yeah, the do model. the very best you can do, but you don't have to be perfect. And yeah. I think a lot of people are scared of being vegan because they feel the need to be perfect. And you, and you don't have to and be. And you're not going to be. Every mm-hmm. time you don't eat meat, you're saving a life. Exactly. Every time you don't eat dairy or eggs, you're, you're keeping an animal out of a prison. So, you know, it, it's okay if every now and then something happens and something slips through the cracks, you know? Yes. That's really great, too. And I just wanted to also um, talk about, like, the eggs. Since you brought up the eggs and, you know, being homesteaders, um, you know, what do you do with your eggs uh, that the chickens lay there on your land? That's a great question. And um, we give them to our dogs. Um, And and children. And and that was one of the last things to go before we went vegan because – because Since they were all rescue hens, we didn't really see anything wrong with eating the eggs, and I don't really see anything wrong with feeding them to the dogs. Mm-hmm. But the reason we quit eating eggs, um, we wanted to support vegans. Yeah, that's the only reason I quit. It really is. Um, I, you know, everyone that comes here and everything we do, vegans are the people that are doing what we ask you to do, not to torture or enslave or slaughter these animals. And if by not eating eggs, I support those people – I'm totally good with that. Plus, um, scrambled tofu is excellent. Yeah. There you scrambled go. Tofu. <laughs> What's the salt? Kamala salt? Yeah, Kalanamic. Kalanamic. Yeah. If you don't have it, get it. Hey. Oh, it's awesome. Um, <laughs> so let's get a little bit into the sanctuary side of things, the day-to-day operations, because I know that we have some people in our community that are actually 
open-minded to starting an animal sanctuary someday. So based from your experience, what kind of advice would you give them to get started? Um, what I would give them to get started is you have to have some type of animal education. Volunteer at a local wildlife or a local sanctuary. Um, get to know um, the animals. Get in and work with animals. Work with um, veterinarians that work mm-hmm. with animals. Work with the wildlife people that so you can you okay. So in the future, when you run into problems, medical problems or issues and stuff like that, you'll be able to spot them because that's the main part about um, animal welfare is, is is making sure you spot it early, any condition that you can see because it's a lot easier to handle before it gets out of control. Um, mm-hmm. I would say you would have to buy land. A good amount of land. You would. You're going to need a lot of pens, well, coops, I, I, fencing. I'm going to interject. I want to talk about sustainability. Um, one of the things we do, and and we really like to promote this to people that donate to us. 100% of our donations go to the animals feed, shelter, and fencing. Yeah. We pay for the land. We pay for the house out of our pockets. Nobody here makes money. Glenn works here full time as um, an animal caretaker, and I hold a full time job. And we donate approximately 50% of our um, yearly budget. We, we, we donate that money to the farm because I firmly believe, how can I ask someone to donate to this if I'm not willing to do it? Mm. And we want to be, we, we, we will never be the people that are saying our animals won't eat this month unless you donate. We want to be sufficient in case there are not donations, all of one these of animals the, will be okay. One of the things when we started, um, we wanted to, make sure that we would never, ever rely on donations, that we would be self-funded in case donations dried up or we didn't get any donations. Um, so we made sure we don't take in enough animals, too many animals that are over. We have a budget that yeah. we allow, and we yeah. won't go over that budget because it's a fail-safe. So if everything else fails, we'll still be able to take care of our animals, feed our animals, and medically care for our animals on our own. Um, I think it's vitally important that people realize you're not you're not going to get when you first start out you're not going to get enough donations to cover all your expenses. We don't we don't hire anybody like Kelly says. 100 percent of our donations go to the animals and their shelter and their medical care, um, which we find vitally was vitally important to us. Um, backing and, is, is big. Yes, and I also know that's unpopular. I know as a nonprofit, we should be saying, oh, God, we live off your donations. And we so appreciate donations. Yes, no, go. I'm it's not a ginormous no help. But, um, <laughs> but it's also, I think it's really important for people to know that the animals that come here will be taken care of regardless of what happens. And mm. if you're opening a, a sanctuary, you really need to look at financially. It's, yes. it's, it's a, it is a drain. It's, it's not expensive. Your, It's expensive. Um, the, the other part is that I don't want to deter people from opening yes. sanctuaries either yeah. because it's vitally important. It is. But yeah. I want you to know the pitfalls that you're going yeah. to run into, you know, because it gets expensive. And then if you're a rural area, just finding a vet that cares about your animals is, is vitally important. Yeah. And it's going to cost you money to have them vets come out because yeah. they're, 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 they they got to travel and then – you know, besides, so you got to pay, it's expensive. Yeah, sure. So you got to yeah. be prepared for that. You know, um, the main thing is, another thing I would say is don't buy cheap feed. Um, you want to yeah. buy, you want to buy good feed for your animals. You want to buy, you want to Just buy, like a human. Just like a human. Just like, yeah, because you want to keep them healthy because the healthier <laughs> are, the, the more money you will save as far as medical expenses. Yeah. Um, you can't skimp on that. You've got good quality hay good quality feed, and you just, you're going to work. You're going it, to, it, it's, it's, it's work. I mean, you're up at dawn, and I mean, you go to, and you're down at sunset. And there's you know? no vacation. And there's no vacation. <laughs> right. Okay, well, when you, you when you, when you have a little slice of heaven, like what you've created out there, to me, that's like a little slice I love of heaven. It. Well, that's the thing. I don't. I don't really want to leave, but I mean. Well, that's what I always say. If we went on vacation, we'd probably just go to a farm yeah, sanctuary. Yeah, we'd probably just go, like, we'd go to like, <laughs> we'd, Of course. We'd probably go to, exactly, we'd go to another farm sanctuary yeah, so, to see what they're doing. Yeah. So that's, <laughs> you know. And you know, don't be afraid to ask questions, and don't be afraid to go to another sanctuary and find out yeah. if it's something that you really want to do. It is consuming. And mm-hmm. um, 
But once you make the commitment, I mean, there's nothing more satisfying. I can't say it's not the most satisfying thing I've ever done in my life. When we get animals, especially the ones that have been, they've lived in a cage all their life or a small enclosure, when they first come out of there and see, like, all of the other animals and, like, the big field and the pond, it's it's the coolest feeling ever. It's it's so worth it. And you just walk outside, you know, and and then movies cruising by with Norman or something, you know, and he's like, hey, what's up? You know? So... It, it, it's 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 wonderful, and and you get an education. It, it's um, I've got a spiritual education for sure um, by mm-hmm. watching these animals and observing them, and learning um, so much that I did not know about animals and why they do things and stuff. Um, it, it's quite a learning process, and it it, it is um, I, it is something that if, if if you love animals and you're willing to commit your time and you're willing to commit your resources than a sanctuary is for you. Wow. That is so moving and inspiring. Like, I'm really excited for people that have reached out and said that they are looking at eventually starting their own sanctuary and, and knowing that, you know, you're there and you're just so generous in the type of knowledge that you provide and, and sharing your experience and knowing that they can go to you and ask these type of questions and see how you're running things. It's true. And, and on the other hand, I mean, it's always good to have more people in more sanctuaries because they do things differently that you might not have thought of. You know what I mean? So you actually share in, in each other's knowledge of, of once you get up and going because it's like anything else. You know, um, you can go through your whole life and you're like, oh, dude, this is, and then one day somebody says something to you and you're like, oh, my God, I never thought of that. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> And people should know, too, there's other ways to help other than opening a sanctuary. Yes, you know, go and volunteer at a sanctuary, of course. But also, there's cubes of truth. There Tampa are Tampa Bay Animal Tampa, Tampa Bay, Bay Animal, animal Save. Save. There's all stuff. kinds of Animal um, Save movements. Um, also, you know, on, on the very lowest level, bake some vegan muffins and take them into your office. You know, There you, you go. Of, right? yeah. you know? Well, we give vegan teas every once in a while, and, and we'll have um, – people over and we will introduce introduce them to all kinds of vegan food besides yeah. you know and the animals and and it, it, it's it's you just got to keep keep it going yeah keep and, moving. And, and you can and that's the thing anyone can do something you know yeah. you don't have to do something major but everyone can take a step beyond not eating animal well, animal the, products the they vegan can, couple said the, well, the least you can do is go vegan yes you exactly. know that's <laughs> so, um, <laughs> It's true. So after that, but, you know, you can try to, and, and on the topic of lunches, all of our volunteers get a free vegan lunch. And so I, that's how I lure many of them here. Yeah, uh, there you go. Them. That is a great lure. And then we send them away with a, with a, with a package of food. Yeah. So they're all like, yeah. <laughs> so they, they don't even come to work. They just watch me work and they're like, when's lunch? <laughs> I'm only kidding. Our volunteers are wonderful. I, you, you could probably edit that out. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> no, I love our volunteers. They are, they are awesome people. So then, and I know that you run your tours because, Kelly, you still, you still work a full-time job during the week, right? Yeah, yes, so I do. Yeah, so you run your tours like pretty much on the weekends. You, you designate the yeah. weekends yeah. for that, yeah. Yes, we do. And, and that's just because um, on the tours, it takes two people. You know, at the very least, our darling goat, Billy, um, loves to headbutt <laughs> everyone but us. So someone <laughs> has to walk him on a leash. Oh, and then if you're out back, you know, somebody's got to keep an eye on Mooby and make sure he's being good while someone else leads the tour. So well, because our animals are free they, they, they free, free, they roam free, and they coexist. So you don't have cows in a pen, goats in a pen, pigs in a pen, chickens in a pen. So they're all running around free. So it takes two people just to keep an eye on things. Yeah. Sure. You know? <laughs> Make sure they don't get out of control. Yeah. So, um, but it, I think the experience is worth it. I think it's cool. And um, I would come here. And that was the basis I wanted you know, when we created yeah. um, the sanctuary. We, we wanted to create a sanctuary where it, it's the animal's land and we are the caretakers. Um, we're not the benevolent masters. We are, we are the... Um, caretakers and servants to the animals and um that was one of the things we wanted to do because i think it's vitally important that that um that's how you approach it you know because if you have the mindset of, of being a master or or you're, you're an gonna, owner an owner 
you know, and then you have a whole different mindset. So Correct. we need to approach it from a different way and, yeah, and give the animals the respect and dignity they deserve. And that's, that's our mission. Them. We're here for them. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's such a great point. Now, what's now as, as caretakers and, um, and rehomers, and I know that that's another extension of what you provide at yeah. the sanctuary is, you know, if it's, uh, if it's somebody, a resident that you're not able to take in, you know, you, you only have it so much room for, you know, the cows and the pigs and, you know, the rabbits, the, the chickens, the geese everybody. And um, so if it's somebody that you're not able to provide for and you're able to rehome, what do you see is the biggest problem out there or what's the most rehomed animal that, uh, that you see? Pigs and roosters. Mm. Um, That's an easy one. And every sanctuary will tell you that if they, they they don't, they're lying. Pigs, (laughs) um, Pigs break my heart. We get calls for pigs almost daily um we cannot take them all we have a backlog on our adoption list even our rehoming um, people can't even our take rehoming any more people pigs. can't take any more pigs on special occasions they do if, it's, if um, we try to get them homes and we never give up um roosters are tough because um it's 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 another hard aspect if you're not a sanctuary that specifically takes in roosters and and you free range your animals. You you really need. You have to watch your amount of roosters because it becomes a detriment to the hens' health if you have too many roosters and not enough hens. So mm. um, it's you got to strike a natural balance there. Well, and, and this is what happens on both of these occasions. People need to know this. People see and baby pigs are adorable. I get that. People see this adorable little pig. And then we get a call usually about two to four years later that they're moving and the place they're moving to can't take the pig or some other excuse and they can't take their pig. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a commitment. Okay. And pigs are as smart, if not smarter than dogs. And one of the problems when you do get rehome them, when you do get them from that scenario, they're heartbroken that their people left them. They don't understand why their people left them, and they don't adjust as well as a dog. No, they do not adjust. Pigs so, are very loyal. And, you know, everyone mm. wants to go out and get that cute little piglet. Instead, why don't you go and adopt a four-year-old pig that needs a home or spend time around them and see if that's an animal you can handle? Although they are domestic and they're wonderful pets and they're super intelligent, they, they're they still a little wild in I that. see the younger people out there, um, pigs – are not an option for you to to guard because you're going to be. It, it's a if commitment. You're renting, you can't. Yeah, if you're renting, it's a commitment. Yes. When you make a commitment to your animal, it's a lifetime commitment. Absolutely. It's not a moving. You need to, you need to find a place that will take pigs. And okay? that's hard to do. And that's hard to do, but that's what you need to do. You need to. And I, mean, I, I would. Yeah. You're not going to not take your dog, right? Yeah. You're taking your dog, but you're not going to take your pig. Yeah. You know, right. so I mean, I'm not, I'm not coming down on people, and I understand situations happen. Yes. But you know, you really need to realize before you buy this animal, am I going to be able to take care of it for the next 15 to 20 years? Okay. Well, so. Yeah. The other one is roosters, and this is another thing people don't know. Everyone wants backyard chickens. Mm, Fine. Yes. Awesome. Um, now, of course, people should know that when you get backyard chickens, all the male chicks they've identified typically get ground up alive or gassed or something horrible. Right. Well, because they don't lay the eggs, right? Exactly. They don't lay eggs. And people cannot have roosters because they crow. And and, and, in the bulk of the city, even if you can have chickens, you can't have roosters. Mm -hmm. So the babies are killed, which is horrible. But even worse, they'll buy like their four chickens from Tractor Supply. And one of the males wasn't identified and it becomes a rooster. And every week we have people email us, I've raised this chicken, I love my chickens, they're backyard chickens, and one of them's a rooster, and the Homeowners Association is finding us daily. We need to change the mm. laws for that. There's well, or the other thing is, don't buy baby chickens, okay? Mm. Go, 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 to, to go to a farm sanctuary and adopt hens that need a home. It's a, you know, or get on an adoption list. Yeah. Even if the, the uh, farm sanctuary like us, once you're here, we don't adopt you out because you're our family now. So w- when we do our adoption program, it's mainly because we can't take something and we hook two mm-hmm. people up and they adopt. If you get on an adoption list at a farm sanctuary, 
they will eventually get hens. They'll yeah. eventually get roosters. I mean, it's inevitable that they'll get the animal that you're looking for. And also with hens, people should know before they get backyard chickens, at around two years old, the hens taper off laying. And we yeah. get tons of hens from people. They don't want to kill the hen, but they don't want something that's not laying eggs. They don't mm. want to spend the resources when they're not getting any product. Which Fine. But I mean, that's fine. Whatever. I mean, Whatever. People are people, and they're just going to be people. But I don't, if people I'm are listening, no. Them. But if people are listening to this, there's a lot of things of oh, having backyard chickens that aren't humane and that aren't as great as they could be. You know. Mm-hmm. And and as far as hens are concerned, too. I mean, they have their egg laying years, and then once they, um, oh, you know, it's about a year. Essentially, they, they actually lay. Yeah, they actually yeah. lay right. eggs for about a year. On, yeah. uh, that's the, the part that people just don't seem to get. That that what because for the first six months they don't lay eggs because mm-hmm. they're, so they're so young. Once they get out of the public stage and they start laying eggs, it, it's it's only a year where they, a year maybe a year and a half where they're laying an egg every other day or or whatever. But um, it's still a, a strain on their system. But that is selective breeding. That's due to selective breeding, which is right. as opposed to as yeah. opposed to be genetically modified, like a commercial chicken, a Cornish rock hen, or something like that, it's commercial. They they are genetically modified, so that there's a big difference there um, as far as as. Um, well, and one of the things I like to tell people because um, we do get so many old hens, and people think, oh, if the hen's not laying eggs, you know, we have no use for. Her. Mm-hmm. Old hens are wonderful, despite the fact that I mean, they, the old hens club. They, they, wonderful <laughs> personalities. Okay, they, I, I, I love old hens, but um, even from a practical viewpoint, they'll still turn your compost, they'll dig up your garden, they, they eat, go through the cow manure, they eat, turn it into dirt. Yeah, they eat all the bugs. I mean, yeah. chickens. Even if they, if you, if you are not using them for eggs and you want to be practical, they're still super cool, Pest useful control. animals. Yeah, they eat. Every type of a bug, they eat ticks, they eat everything. And so even on the most practical level, they're still so, um, they're fantastic to have on a homestead. Yeah. All the animals that, especially farm animals that you have, you can live with them without eating them, and they provide such a benefit to your to your environment. Yes. Um, I mean, we, the cows poop, and I don't, you know, you collect the poop, you put it in your garden, you grow your vegetables, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it, the goats, they handle all the vines and roughage. Mm-hmm. Everything that the cows don't eat, the goats eat. Yeah. Um, it's, the it's, ducks eat the mosquito larvae. The ducks eat mosquito pond. larvae out of the pond. Mm-hmm. The, the chickens are the best pest control. Yeah. And we just got a guinea for the first time, a little guinea. Ginny the pit. guinea. She's, she's awesome. a pit. <laughs> but she's a bug-eating machine. So, um, I didn't realize Oh, what that. a good little worker you got there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go, you know, so... And they do it naturally. It's yeah. not like, you know, I'm not placing them around saying, you have to stay here and eat bugs. <laughs> you know, they're just doing it. They you just know? do their so, thing. Yeah. And they do their thing. And then once your garden gets growing and you got things growing, and, and um, right before your vegetables start to come in fruit, you can send the chickens in and they'll wipe out every bug in that garden. Yep. Um, so, and without using any pesticides, without right. using herbicides, without any well, of the sides. We even, in, in our rabbit um, refuge, we have a little rabbit area. Um, we have chickens in there because they provide a natural pest control, so we don't have to put anything on the rabbits. The chickens mm. eat the fleas, the mice, mice and pigs. the pigs, they eat all the stuff. So the rabbits can live naturally, and the chickens act as like a, a janitor. We yeah. want, we're trying to create a coexisting environment and, and work within nature and the natural balance. And that's, that's what we try to do. And we also try, try to provide a habitat for wildlife. Um, so we take over a third of our land and we call it a non-human zone. We don't go in there. Um, the animals go in there. We'll go in there if there's an animal in distress or, or if somebody's missing or we hear something going on. But otherwise, we leave it alone. So it's a self-sustaining um, area on our farm where wildlife lives and, mm-hmm. and, and benefits from it. And then right next to that, we have the permaculture garden coming over that, which provides food for us and wildlife. Well, mm. and on the topic of the wildlife habitat, anyone can do this. You know, anyone, even if you have a city lot, yeah. take like that back corner of your lot, let the grass let grow tall, grow. plant some wildflowers for the bees and for the butterflies, and give nature a little spot. Because if we all did that, nature would have a much greater foothold. Absolutely. And you guys are just a living 
breathing example of what life could be like once we start to phase out um, animal agriculture in the way that it's being, you know, produced today. And well, that was our, our be the change yeah. um, was, was our motto when we started yeah. homesteading. I and now you. we've come so now far. Now we're really being the yes. change. <laughs> <laughs> you really are the change for sure. Uh, <laughs> But, but yeah, and, and that was the Gandhi quote, and we, we, we lived with that in the back of our minds whenever we, we did stuff. We, we, we wanted to um, be the change, be what you want the world to be, you know. And, and so what we're trying to do is, is create an environment where everything can coexist, and, and you can still produce your food, and the animals don't have to die, yeah. and, um, and you live within the rules of nature. Yeah. and. And nature's brutal sometimes. I'm not, you know, it's not always beautiful. True. I know a lot of people like to bring that up, too, in conversation when they're exploring the idea of what it must be like to uh, live as a vegan if they haven't quite wrapped their mind around it yet. You know, they, you know they'll, they'll talk about, you know, well, this is the circle of life and, and nature is brutal out there. And so it's, it's really interesting to hear from your perspective and how you have made the shift towards what you used to eat before and then how you eat and live now. And that is such a huge, huge inspiration. And it's so educational for other people to kind of pick up on. So I just absolutely love what you do. And thank you so very much for everything that you're doing to help people with the education and to help those animals too. Thank you, Stephanie. And it's always, um, See, and, and you know it's funny, and you help plant the seeds. And you That's help the plant cool the seeds. Yeah. So, <laughs> this is what people should know. Like, if you yeah. turn one person into a vegan, you never know. They never know what's going to happen. And save like hundreds <laughs> of animals. So, cool. <laughs> you, you just don't know, do you? Exactly. We're all about so, planting the seeds, baby. Yes, it is. <laughs> and let them grow. Yep. Absolutely. And, and we appreciate you and David so much. Yeah, so, you and, guys are awesome. Uh, and um, thank you so much. Absolutely. Oh, my gosh. And um, please tell everybody how they can connect with you and what they can do to help support you. Um, well, you can find us online at Florida Rescue Farm and also on Instagram and Facebook, um, Florida Rescue Farm. You can look us up. If you go to our website, we have a section on support where you can you can buy a bag of grain for the animals. You can donate. Um, we take in-kind donations. We love to have volunteers. Um, and, you know, even if you're not supporting us, even if you just want to come out and meet the animals, if that makes an impact in your life, that's, that's supporting what we do because that's what we're trying to do is make an impact on people's lives. That's wonderful. Amazing talking to you guys. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Stephanie. It was great talking to you. <laughs> Bye-bye, Stephanie. That was Kelly and Glenn at Florida Rescue Farm. Check out their website and learn more about their sanctuary at floridarescuefarm.org. And connect with them on Facebook and Instagram, too, at Florida Rescue Farm. And if you're planning a visit to Central Florida anytime soon, definitely let them know that you want to swing by for a visit with their animals. They're about two hours southwest of Orlando and about an hour south of Tampa. If you're looking for recipes and support from fellow rebels who are transitioning out of the old food habits, don't forget to join us in the Eating Like You Give a Damn community on Facebook. Go to eatinglikeyougiveadamn.com forward slash group and request to join. I look forward to seeing you in there. And until next time, veg on, rebels. <laughs>